Check, check, check. Yeah, check. Okay, thank you.
ya. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Faith Community Church. Uh, let's stand and we'll sing some songs. <laughs> You can be seated here, and I do want to welcome you to Faith Community Church. If you are new or visiting, my name's Russell. I'm the pastor here, and I'm just so excited that not to be in church today, but to chat with us here at Faith Community Church. Can you guys hear me now? Is this working? Did you hear? You want me to start again? No, we're good. I'm Russell. Welcome to church. That's the short. <laughs> I'm so excited that you guys could be here. I just want to do a, a couple of announcements as we continue in this time of worship this morning. Uh, a lot of these can be found on the church website, which is a great resource for you. We do our best to keep it up to date, and so it would be meaningful to us if you actually looked at it once in a while. If you're looking for information about the church or going on at the church, you can go to woodstockfcc.com. That's woodstockfcc, which is Faith Community Church. 
Com. So, for instance, if you went there right now, and if you pull out your phone, I'll assume that's what you're doing. If you went there right now, one of the first things you would see is a banner that says, Let us know you joined church today. Now, of course, I can see those of you here, especially if you are watching online, I have no idea, or we have no idea, that you took time out of your week to join us unless you tell us. And so I would love for you to fill out that Connect card that you can find online. And even more important than just having a record of your visit is right on those Connect cards, we give you an opportunity to share prayer requests with us. We would love to be praying with you and for you. We want to be on your team and in your corner in that way. But we can't do it unless you tell us how, how we can join you in prayer. And so I encourage you, fill out that Connect card. Give us that record of your visit. Let us know you took time to join us. But also let us know how we can be praying for you. Also on the church website, if you are looking for ways to support the church financially, the day-to-day -day operations of the church, but also the ministry that run through the church, we try to make this easy. So at .com, and the top right hand corner, there's a button that's give. If you click it, you'll see the different ways you can give, whether digitally through e transfer, you can give online securely with debit or credit, or if you'd like to give with cash or check, if you're watching online, reach out to us. We'll arrange a safe pickup or drop off of that. Or if you're here in person and would like to give with cash or check, the offering plate on the back table. So on your way in or out of service, drop your tithe or offering there. We thank you, thank you, thank you for your support of the church and all that happens in and through the church. Lastly, on the website, if you are looking for the best way to stay up to date, you need to sign up for the weekly newsletter. Once a week, typically Wednesday mornings, I try to get a newsletter out to you. Usually there's a little short devotion that I write at the top of it, but at the bottom, it is just full of all the information that you could possibly need about the upcoming week. So I encourage you to sign up for the newsletter. So you go to woodstockfcc.com, you scroll to the bottom, there's a large blue box that says join the weekly newsletter. It takes a first name and an email. That's it. If you can't figure that out, but you have an email and a first name, I can figure it out for you. You just let me know, and I will get you signed up for that. This is by far the best and easiest way to stay up to date with everything happening here at Faith Community Church. The newsletter in the last few weeks, you should know that next Sunday, which is, what month are we in? April? April 21st is next Sunday, and that's going to be a Kids Min Sunday, so make sure you're marking your calendars for that. Parents, if you have kids that you're ready to bring out, you want to make sure you know next Sunday will be a Kids Min week. Also, another announcement that's not on the newsletter, so you don't know about this yet, so you actually have to listen, but we'll make sure we get it in the newsletter next week, is upcoming in the first weekend of May, there is a, a special uh, CMA, which is the Christian Motorcycle Association, Pastor Jack and Debbie are part of. They're having a special event at our church, I think it's called, oh, I had it in my head and I just lost it, Seasons, um, has the word Seasons in it. I can't remember the rest of the name now. It's gone. This is why I write things down. Pastor Jack is going to give us some more information about this, though, and they're going to be here on Friday night, all day Saturday, and they're going to come and join us for church on Sunday as well. And for, for us as well, but for a few more volunteers, it's Saturday, which is May 4th. So if you have some free time on May 4th, and you want to help out, come talk to me. Or if you don't have free time on the May 4th, but you have the gift of baking or buying some drinks for the Saturday uh, luncheon event, you can support them and the church that way. And you can come talk to me or Lori or Pastor Jack or Deb about that. And we will make sure that you know how you can help support us in that event uh, coming up on May the 3rd to the 5th that they're going to be here. So uh, look for more information about that in the newsletter this coming week. And come talk to me if you have time or some giftings in cooking or buying things, and we will uh, definitely take your support that way. Why don't you stand with me this morning as I read a call to worship. I'm going to read from Psalm 150. Psalm 150 is this great call to worship that reminds us of why we are here and what we are doing, and it begins like this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome to church this morning.
Well, I am one proud grandpa today. I have the honor of uh, doing the dedication for our granddaughter, Eden Rose, and uh, as I did for our grandson, Eli, Eden's brother, and my oldest grandson, Ryan, is here today, and our youngest granddaughter, uh, Mila, second youngest, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm all confused. But anyway, it's great to have Mila here today. Uh, grandparents are here as well, uh, Ron's folks and, and Ron's brother, Michael. And uh, two of, of um, Eden's great-grandparents are here. My mom, Ruthie's in the back there, and Kim's dad, Ron. So it's a wonderful occasion, uh, and I feel so blessed to be able to be part of this. Matthew's Gospel records, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that she may early know and follow the will of God, may live and die a Christian, and come unto everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it will be your duty as parents to teach her early the fear of the Lord, to watch over her education, that she not be led astray, to direct her youthful mind to the holy scriptures and her feet to the sanctuary to restrain her from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you lies to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. I now ask you, the congregation, will you commit yourselves as the body of Christ to support and encourage these parents as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to this child? and to assist by nurturing her growth towards spiritual maturity? If so, answer, we will. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this blessed occasion, for this dear child. We pray for her parents on this day, and grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins, and we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. And at this time, we lovingly dedicate Eden Rose Joseph to the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray that you will take this child into your loving care, abundantly enrich her with your heavenly grace, bring her safely through the perils of childhood, deliver her from the temptations of youth, lead her to a personal knowledge of Christ as Savior, help her to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all people, and to persevere therein to the end. Uphold Ron and Victoria with loving care, that with wise counsel and holy example, they may faithfully discharge their responsibilities, both to this child and to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we present to you Eden Rose Joseph.
I'm not exactly sure how to follow that. I think we should give Eden the mic back and she can uh, finish the service out here for us. I think she'll do a pretty good job. Oh, I do want to welcome everyone again to Faith Community Church and guest family for coming to join us for such a special occasion of the dedication of Eden. And uh, I'm so grateful for not only, you know, Ron's presence, who is much more uh, visible here, and Victoria's presence in, in different ways, but also the kids too. And we're so glad that we can be a part of your church family and that journey in that. And I want you to know that we, as your church family, take those commitments we made just as serious as you guys do as parents. And uh, we're excited for what the future holds. And I am excited to, to be back in service today. Of course, if you were here last week, you would know I was away. Uh, Bethany and I, we took a, a little day trip, uh, which was a, a great, a little bit of a great relaxing time away. But when I say relaxing, I mean we did a lot of driving with young kids. Um, so we're still very tired from it. And we're still recovering a week later, but it was, it was good. I actually got to go to the church that I grew up in from the age of 8 to 18 and see some people I haven't seen in probably 10 years and see some of my childhood friends back in the town I grew up in. So it was a nice time away, but it was still tiring when you travel a couple hours. I think we did like five-ish, five-plus hours of driving round trip on Sunday. Um, but I am grateful we could do that. Thank you for allowing us to do that. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for uh, not only filling in the pulpit, but Pastor Mark and Kim stepping up in other ways last week, too, to fill in some gaps. We appreciate that. I'm glad that uh, I, I can leave knowing that even if complications arise, there are people willing to step up and serve. And so we, we especially thank you guys for serving in that way, being willing to serve. Let me pray for this service this morning, or at least this aspect of the service. And so, Lord, we are grateful uh, for this service, all that's already happened from the songs and the scriptures that we've heard, the prayers, the dedication, and all that will come through the message, some time of reflection and communion and more songs. Lord, we just pray that all that happens this morning would be pleasing to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word this morning. Your word is alive, active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and you can use it to speak to us now. And so in that line, then, Lord, we just pray that you will begin to quiet our minds, and you'll soften our hearts so that we would be receptive and open and ready and listening for you to speak. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, for those of you who know me fairly well, and some of you might not, so I'm going to give you some insight, but if you do know me fairly well, you should know that I'm a bit of a, what I am calling, and I mean this very kindly, a quirky person. And uh, I, I have a lot of quirks, and if I'm really honest and doing some good, honest self-reflection, something we all should do, I, I have to realize that most of the things that make me quirky don't matter. <laughs> most of the things that make me quirky are, are me being very picky about things that ultimately don't matter at all. So things like pens, you guys have heard me talk about pens, which should tell you enough that I'm a quirky person, that this isn't the first time I've talked to you about pens, uh, but I, I am picky about pens. I, I like to use a very specific pen when I'm writing, and uh, it's not an expensive, fancy pen. It's a very cheap pen that I can't ever remember whether you get it from Staples or Walmart, but one of those two stores sells it, but I buy so many at a time that I only have to buy them once every few years because I love this pen. I just like the way it writes, but I'm not only picky about the kind of pen, I'm picky about where pens go, and this can drive Bethany a little crazy sometimes, my wife, so I always like to have a pen in my notebook. It has got a little pen slot. It should stay there. I also have a pen in my bag, despite my notebook always being in my bag. I always have a pen in the front pocket of my bag. On my desk at home, there's always a pen on it. And if Bethany takes my pen and doesn't move it back, that drives me nuts because I want to know where the pen is for when I need a pen. I shouldn't have to look for it. It should just be there because that's where it goes. And so over the years, Bethany and I, we've almost been married 10 years now. She, she has often joked that she's going to start labeling pens, getting a label maker and put labels on it and have one for the fridge, one for the freezer, one for the bedroom. And uh, she hasn't done it yet, but I'm a little bit picky about pens. And that's not the only thing. We could give more examples. I'll give you one more. Uh, I'm picky about towels. And at least this one I can blame on my family. See, my mom's nodding her head. This isn't my fault. I was born into this. It goes back at least to my grandma, maybe a little further. But for the first few years of our marriage, Bethany was not allowed to fold towels because she did it wrong. In my mind, there is a right way to fold a towel. And if you don't do it that way, I'm going to take it and refold it because I am picky about things that don't matter at all. Thankfully, 
almost 10 years of marriage now. Bethany's got the hang of it. She's allowed to fold towels now. I've even complained with Bethany. You know, I said I wasn't going to tell you more, but I've even complained about Bethany for how she boils water. That's the kind of picky person I am. I know you're thinking, how can you boil water wrong? Don't ask me, but she did, so. Uh, This is not the point, okay? We could go on. In fact, if you talk to Bethany later, she had to be away today for uh, work. But if you talk to her at a different time, she could probably go on even longer than I could about the things that make me quirky, and that's the word we'll use, my uniqueness. But that's not the point. The point I'm trying to make this morning is because I have all these quirks or these things that make me unique, it also means I unfortunately have a lot of pet peeves because I, in my mind, there's a certain way to do things, and if you don't do it that way, it's going to drive me nuts. I have a lot of pet peeves, but I've learned over the years that the fact that I'm a very quirky person, not only does it mean that I have a lot of pet peeves, but it means... I often do things that get on others' nerves, and marriage has taught me a lot about that. It's a miracle Bethany loves me with all of my weirdness. Now, here's the point I'm trying to make in in a very roundabout way to start this morning. It's not just me. We all have pet peeves. Maybe you're not as particular as I am, and maybe you don't have as many pet peeves as I do, but everyone has things that get on their nerves or has people that get on their nerves. And we could spend an entire day coming up with a list of what those might be or who they might be. But the, the, the point is we all have these pet peeves, these things that get on our nerves, because we all have a view or understanding of how the world or the people around us should work or act. And when they don't, when they behave differently, we think uh, differently than we think they should, it begins to annoy us. And really, when we're talking about these pet peeves, what we're talking about is annoyance. It's usually some minor thing. It's not some earth-shattering, colossal issue that's going to divide and break the relationship. Usually, when you have these things going on, when people act differently than you think they should, and it annoys you, it's this small, quirky little thing that, if you could be really honest, doesn't really matter. And now, I'm not sure that it's possible to live without pet peeves. Maybe it is, but I haven't figured that out yet if it is, but I do know this about them. Pet peeves, that is these small, minor things that if we're really honest, ultimately don't matter. They have the power not only to steal our own happiness as we allow them to annoy us, but if we do that, if we allow them to steal our happiness and allow them to start to shift our emotions, we're going to find that we also begin to treat others in a way that's going to steal their happiness too could say it this way, when you, uh, what you allow to affect you will have an effect on how you interact with others. And so not only is it important for your own sake, your own joy, your own happiness, can I say your own sanity, that you learn to deal with these things, but it's for the sake of others too. Because what you allow to affect you will have an effect on how you interact with others. So it's for the sake of others. It's for the sake of your witness and your representation of Christ to the world. This is really important. It sounds silly, but it's actually very important. And it should matter to you a great deal. Maybe I could say it this way. How you allow the actions of others to affect you will have an effect on how your interactions with them affect them. So what's our solution then? Or maybe we could say it this way. What's the goal? Here's really simply stated. The goal is maturing in godly character. And as you do, minor things will stay minor. They, They won't have this big influence on you. In fact, if they only have a minor influence on you, you can therefore still have a large positive influence for the kingdom of God on those you meet. Listen to what Paul says. This is Ephesians 4. We'll start with verse 1. Paul says, I urged you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We could spend a whole time talking just about that one sentence, but I don't want to because I want to get to the next verse in a minute here. But what Paul is urging Christians to do here is to live up to their name, which is a high calling. He, he, He is saying, you are professing that you have lives transformed by the power and love and grace of Christ. Then live it. Live like that's true. Because so often we don't. It's something we need to hear, especially if we are people who allow minor things or annoyances to affect us, our emotions, and which in turn affect our actions towards others and can often fail, cause us to fail to live our lives worthy of the calling we've received. So we need to hear this. We are called to live a life worthy 
of the calling we receive. We are called to live out a life that matches what we profess with our mouths. I mean, the question is, how do we do this? How do I live a life worthy of the calling? How do I stop allowing minor things to steal my happiness and cause me to act in unbecoming ways to others? Paul tells us, verse 2, you ready? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, everyone's had that experience where you know or you have uh, had this happen to you where uh, you're in a good mood, and then one minor thing's happened, and that good mood's completely gone. You know it doesn't take much to steal your happiness. You can very quickly go from having a good day to a bad day. You can very quickly go from treating others with kindness and love and respect to, to finding yourself angry and frustrated with them and beginning to lash out in unproportionate ways. And when it's some big, massive issues that's causing this shift in your emotions, you feel a little justified, right? Like it's this big thing, it's colossal, it's going to cause divide if we don't get this resolved. And so and maybe at times then you would be justified in your emotions and your anger. And we got to be clear, anger is not a sin. The Bible doesn't say never be angry. What it says is in your anger, don't sin. So it's an emotion, it's a tool that helps us make sense of the world around us. But here's the reality that I think most of us don't want to believe, but it's true most of the time when we have that shift in our emotions, when all of a sudden we find ourselves frustrated and angry, most of the time we allow this shift to happen, not over something big, but something very trivial. So Paul gives us a framework to put into practice, a framework that will help us keep a better perspective and help us to live with others in a world that doesn't always work exactly how we think it should. He gives us a framework to help us to live a life worthy of the calling we've received. And he tells us four things we're to do. Four things to do as we live and interact with others. He begins with this. Be completely humble. A lot of pet peeves, these little things that we allow to steal our happiness, cause that shift in emotion, they're a result of pride. They're a result of us thinking, I know better than others. And they should just do the things the way I think they should just do them. Have you ever said that? I've said it before. Can I be that honest? I've said, boy, if people would just let me make all the decisions in their life, they'd be so much happier. If I could just choose what they're doing and how they do it, boy, they would find so much happiness because clearly I know better than they do. But what the Bible tells us is that the world would actually be a better place is if we interacted with those around us in humility. Philippians 2, 3 to 4, this is what Paul says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the other. So it begins in humility, which is valuing others above yourself. It's not looking only to your own interest but, or what might benefit you, but that which would benefit others. Humility, I think C.S. Lewis always said it best. He, he says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. We've got it wrong so often when it comes to humility and pride. Let me, let me set the record straight. Ready? It's not humble to say, oh, I'm just a nobody. I don't really matter. I'm not that important. That's not being humble. That's not a healthy self-worth or esteem. It's demeaning the masterwork of God as he created the uniqueness of you. And that's not what humility is. Humility is not about putting yourself down. It's about raising others up. It's when you consider the needs of others instead of just your own. When, when your first response to a situation isn't to think of yourself, but the other person. Listen, if you want to have a strong witness to the world around you, and you want to be able to show that you have a transformed life through the finished work of Christ, if you want to be that good ambassador of Christ in the world to all that you meet, if you want to live a life, as Paul says, worthy of your calling, you ready? Then it begins by being humble. But it continues, as Paul says, by being gentle. Uh, I love this. Gentleness is listed as a character trait. You know, one of, the, of those people who, if your life has been transformed by the work of Christ and you have the indwelling spirit, we, we have this list. We call it the fruit of the Spirit, and gentleness is on it. So this is Galatians 5, 22, 23. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The list shows the type of character that we ought to have. If we are going to profess to have lives transformed by the love and grace of Christ, this is the type of character that we ought to have, and it's not just this idealized list that we talk about. It's something that we are supposed to live out, and in it, 
is gentleness. In other places in the Bible, Philippians 4, Paul tells us, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Jesus said that he was gentle and had a hum, uh, he was humble in heart, and we are told to be like Christ. We are told elsewhere to clothe ourselves in gentleness. We are told to always be ready to give a response to people who might have questions about the hope we have, but it says, but do it with respect and gentleness. See, gentleness is learning to respond with love and kindness at all times, even if a situation is heated. Gentleness is about keeping a level head and being able to respond without harsh words. Listen, when someone is getting on your nerves, you can, you can keep living a life that's worthy of your calling if you can respond in love and gentleness, which is difficult, by the way. Sometimes it'll be pretty easy, but sometimes that just that right person knows how to rub you just the wrong way, and it can be hard to respond in gentleness, and it can be hard to be humble, but here's how you do it. The next one, you do it by learning to be patient. Now, the word you see here in, in Ephesians 4 that we see translated as patient, it comes from, it's basically the, the, the Greek word has two uh, English words. It means to be long-tempered. To be patient means to be long-tempered, which I, I love because it points back to this description of God that we get in, in, in Exodus 34. Um, so Exodus 34, 6 to 7. And by the way, I've said this before, but in, in our modern culture, we have John 3.16, right? That's the verse everyone knows. Even people outside the church know what John 3.16 says. Inside the Bible, in the ancient time for the Israelites, Exodus 34 was their John 3.16. This is the verse that all of the Hebrews knew, all of the Israelites knew. It's the most quoted verse throughout the Bible in the Old and New Testament. It, this is this beautiful description of God, and it says this, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And we can see here that God is described in a similar way as slow to to anger, but what actually it literally says in Hebrew, you ready for this? It says, God is long of nose. That's what it says in the Hebrew. God is long of nose. And so a, a way that the ancient Hebrews described anger was to say that their nose burned with anger. That's how they would describe anger. You can see phrases like this all over the Bible. Usually we just translate it as their anger burned, which makes sense. That's the idea behind the idiom that's being used. It's describing this, this phenomenon that happens when you get angry. You get physically hot, right? Especially in the face. We still use those kind of descriptions. Think of cartoons, right? Maybe, I don't know anymore, but at least older cartoons, when someone got angry, what happened? Their face would turn beet red. Often steam coming out of the ears. You'd hear the kettle sound. It's all about depicting they're, 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 they're getting hot. And we still use those kind of phrases, right? We'll say, well, that person's hot-tempered. So in the Hebrew Bible then, they, the, when anger is being talked about through the Old Testament, it's almost always described using one of two words, either nose or heat, or often the combination of those, a hot nose. But in contrast then, we can understand and see that when someone is patient, that person is described as having a long nose because it takes them a long time for their nose to heat up. It takes a long time for them to be angry. And so in Exodus 34, this most quoted verse in all of Scripture, uh, God is described as being long of nose. He is slow to anger. And we are supposed to be like God in this way. We are to be long of nose. We are to be long-tempered. We could say it another way. We are to be patient. We shouldn't go from zero to 100 quickly. It should be a slow heat up. And if we are people of long noses, often what happens is the situation that is causing our nose to start to get hangry, it, it, it will resolve before our entire nose gets hot. We are to be long of nose. We are to be patient. There's, a, there's another really cool way of describing this. And, you know, I took this out of my notes this morning, and, and it's not there anymore, but I'm going to tell you it anyway, so I don't know why I took it out, because I probably could have told you it better if I left it in my notes. But I, I remember a couple of years ago, Bethany and I started um, getting into watching baking shows. Bethany still was really into baking shows and competitions. I, I like the cooking ones a bit more because I'm not much of a baker, but I remember watching a baking show. I think it was Great Canadian Bacon Challenge. You guys ever seen that one? It's a good show. It's great, and uh, I think they do it at Ryerson College. It's really neat, um, and I remember learning about this process called tempering chocolate. Now, if you're a baker, you probably know this. I don't. I looked it up because I'm that kind of person where they talk about something. I said, I want to know what that is, 
So I went and looked it up, and so tempering chocolate is this process where you have to slowly heat up the chocolate and slowly cool it down. And I learned it's very easy to mess this up, and so when you're watching these, these amateur bakers in this baking show, they often get it wrong because it's a very specific process where if you heat the chocolate up too quickly, it becomes ruined. And if you heat it up too hot, it becomes ruined. And if you let it stay hot too long, it becomes ruined. It's this difficult process to temper the chocolate. You have to heat it up at the right amount for the right amount of time and cool it back down. And I remember when I was learning about this, I thought, what a great example for what it means to be long of nose or to be slow-tempered. If we get, if we heat up too quickly, something's wrong. If we get too hot, something's wrong. And if we stay hot too long, something's wrong. We're to be long of nose like God, slow to anger as we live a life, as Paul says, worthy of our calling. And so how do we do that? We do it again. We do it by being humble, by being gentle, and by being patient. And really the only way to live out all three of those things is to get to the last step, which is to bear with one another in love. Here's my definition for bearing with one another in love. Give others the benefit of the doubt. Give others the benefit of the doubt. I remember Bob Goff. Anyone know who Bob Goff is? If you don't, go look him up later. You'll thank me. Read any book he's ever written, and you'll thank me. I remember uh, hearing him speak once. I got to see him and speak to him and talk to him, which was amazing. And I remember him saying, when it comes to this, he said, I always do two things when I meet someone. I assume they're smarter than me, and I assume they love Jesus more than me. That's his starting point for meeting anyone ever. He assumes they're smarter, and he assumes they love Jesus more than he does. We have to learn to give others the benefit of the doubt. We're not going to judge them or prejudge them especially. And it's about reminding yourselves that you don't know the details of every situation or of all the details of their situation in the life. You don't know what's truly going on in their lives. So you need to learn to do your best to reserve your judgment. Do your best to think good of them. Just assume they, they are smarter than you. Just assume they love Jesus more than you do. Like, wouldn't you hate if someone built their entire opinion on you in one day? or in one bad day, or one bad decision. You know, I would much rather learn that I thought better of someone than they actually are than I thought worse of someone than they actually are. So you give others the benefit of the doubt. And Jesus taught really profoundly on this. This is his words from Matthew 7, verses 3 to 5. It says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? You hypocrite, first take out the plank of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, I always say this is any indication uh, of Jesus' humor. He had a promising career in comedy ahead of him. This is, think about how Jesus goes about teaching this lesson. It's actually just in a ridiculous way. The example he gives is ludicrous. Like he's saying, okay, there's this guy, and he is walking around with a two-by-four sticking out of his eyes. He's saying it takes him 30 minutes to get dressed in the morning because he's got to navigate the shirt around the board to get it over his head. Every time he has to turn his head, people around him have to duck. It's just this ludicrous picture that Jesus is painting, and it is so obvious that this guy has a huge chunk of wood sticking out of his head, and despite this, he doesn't even notice it. He assumes that when people are staring, it's just because of his boyish good looks. He can't see the log in his own eyes, but from a mile away, he can notice a stranger rubbing his eye, and he runs over them, and he says, be careful. Don't you know it can be dangerous to get something in your eye? It's this absurd example, but that's the point, right? That's the point that Jesus is doing. He's trying to catch our attention through just outrageous exaggeration because the reality is we all have eagle eye vision when it comes to others, especially their faults. But we are blind when it comes to examining ourselves. We have more expertise on the faults and failures of our friends and family than we do on our own faults. We spend more time and effort trying to fix others instead of making sure we ourselves are living a life that lives up to our calling. Maybe a more modern day example of this, you've probably heard this before, a story could go like this. A man was driving down the highway when he received a frantic phone call from his wife and she said, honey, be careful. I just heard on the news, someone is driving the wrong way down the freeway. And he said, honey, that's not the half of it. There are hundreds of them. See, Jesus is teaching that we are so blind to our own faults, our own errors, even our own quirks. 
We're like a man with a forehead eye and doesn't know it. We are like someone driving down the wrong side of the freeway and just completely unaware of it. You see this command then to bear with others in love as you are patient and gentle and humble. It's a reminder that when you see faults in others or when people begin to get on your nerves, when you see the speck in their eye, it's a reminder that you have a two by four in yours. So you better look in the mirror first. And so we can understand a huge aspect then of living a life worthy of the calling you've received, that is living a life that matches what we profess. If we say we have a life transformed by the love and grace of Christ, if we want to live a life out in reality that our actions will match what we say, it's understanding then that we each have a lot of work to do on ourselves. It's understanding that change needs to begin, not with trying to get the speck out of others' eyes, but taking the plank out of our own eye first. You want the world to be more tolerant? Be more tolerant. You wish people would complain less? You know what? When you quit complaining, that's one less person already. You know, Michael Jackson, he said it well. I've never quoted Michael Jackson in the sermon, but there's a good place to start. He said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, and no message could have been any clearer. If they want to make this world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. See, before you start pointing out the specs in others, make sure to first check your own life. Ask God to reveal to you if you are carrying around a log in your eye. We owe it to one another to be patient, to bear with one another in love. Because here's the truth. We all drop the ball from time to time. I remember years ago reading about this story of an elderly lady. She was in her late 90s, and uh, for this year, she decided Christmas shopping was just too much for her. She's done it all these years, but going store to store, buying for all the extended family now was just too much. So instead, she decided this year she's going to mail each person a card and a check to all her family. And she was a, a very loving lady, very caring lady, but she was always a lady of few words. So in her very normal and concise way, she wrote inside the card, buy your own present this year. And she gathered her pile of cards, mailed them out, and the rest of the holidays, they came and went. And it wasn't until the new year where she was cleaning up her desk, and she was horrified to find a stack of checks she had forgotten to mail with the cards. <laughs> you see, we all drop the ball from time to time. We all have bad days, but let's remember this. And then the next time you feel your peeves being pet, we can make the conscious effort to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Because here's the secret of being patient with others. Don't make an oak tree out of a speck of dust. Let's be long-nosed people. Let's never forget that God is long of nose. He is slow to anger. He is compassionate and gracious. He bears with us all out of love. You know, I think about all the stories through Scripture, and I realize Jesus was never short on grace. If you feel a little short on grace this morning to give to others— if you feel like your patience are a little thin, if you feel like your nose is a little too short and you're not bearing with others in love, then you need to go back to the source. You need to reconnect with Jesus because you can't do this in your own strength. But the good news is Jesus is gracious and compassionate and loving and promises to provide you and I with everything that we need to live a godly life. So we're going to take a moment this morning, in just a minute here. In fact, I'll invite Ron and Nick up to the stage here at this time. We're going to take a moment to remember just how deep the love of God runs for you. We're going to take a time to remember how in humility and gentleness Jesus came, and in his patience with you, and through his love for you, he died in your place so that you could be reconciled back to God. And so in a moment here... Um, we're going to receive the elements of communion, if you would like. Ron and Tim will be playing as we do. And I'll, I'll just give them some instructions here. I'll ask after you receive them, just take them back to your seat. Hold on to them. You can stand and sing. You can sit and have some contemplation and, and communion with God in that way. But once all have received, I'll instruct us, and we'll partake together. And if you would like me to bring the elements out to you, I'll start with you. Just raise your hand. I'll, I'll come find you. But Ron and the team are going to come. They're going to lead us through a song that's about giving God our all giving God our heart, not holding anything back from him. And when you feel ready and you want to respond to that invitation of Jesus to come, just come, receive the elements, and then hold on to them. We'll partake together. So I'll turn it over to Tim and Ron here.
We remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So would you give thanks, and would you eat in remembrance of what Christ has done for you? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So would you give thanks and drink in remembrance of what Christ has done for you? For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you stand with us as we sing in response to this service, to communion together, to the dedication, to the scriptures, to what God has been saying to you and what you've been saying to him. So let's respond in praise. Let's go. 
Thank you for joining us for service today. Would you receive these words as a benediction? It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Would you go in the peace and joy and love of the Lord this morning? Thank you for joining us. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.